Okay, I uh, want to welcome everybody to the USA Hockey webinar series presented by Pure Hockey. We're excited to have uh, Coach Jay Verity on today. So a um, couple things prior, we're, uh, we're uh, YouTube live in it. Um, so if you don't have that link or you have friends that want to try, try to get on, go to the Facebook ADM page or USA Hockey Coach on Twitter and you'll find the, the link for that. And all, all of them are recorded, all of them are archived on there. So if you miss something or you, you want to go back, you can always check there. I'll be monitoring the uh, questions, both on the, the Zoom for the Q&A, but also on YouTube Live. So uh, give me time just to check it out. But um, just, just really want to start off and thank uh, Coach Verity for being here. And, um, you know, just kind of going through our process. Uh, a lot of great things were being said by a lot of different people about uh, Coach Verity. Some of the things were about the humblest, easiest guy to work with would be one. Um, but also, you know, a guy that uh, is, uh, he brings the team together and his preparation is paramount. So uh, currently he's the head coach of the Tucson Roadrunners in the American Hockey League. And um, he had, uh, his team was doing so well during the year, they, they voted him to be the American Hockey League All-Star Game coach, which is a, a, a great honor, I'm sure a great experience. But um, Coach Verity played at uh, Union College um, as a player. And I uh, want to kind of ask you, Coach Verity, how did you get into coaching? Uh, my coaching path is, is pretty interesting. Actually, I was playing at Union uh, as the junior. And uh, I was having some shoulder problems. Thought I was going to get shoulder surgery. Went in, told it was uh, spinal stenosis. And uh, started my coaching career. So uh, my senior season at Union... I spent living with the other three captains, but when we would walk to the rink, I was a senior uh, at Union, we would walk to the rink together. Those guys would go to the locker room and I would go to the coach's room. And uh, that was really the start of my coaching career in, in 2001. And I was able to kind of just bounce around through a couple of leagues um, for a couple of years. So uh, you started coaching at Union and then from there you went to uh, coach, U16 or 16U hockey in Chicago? Yeah, uh, in St. Louis, actually. So I'm from St. Louis originally. Um, and I was able to go back and I thought, I got this degree from Union. I'm going to use this degree. Like, uh, this is what I'm going to do. So I, I got back home and I started coaching the 16U team uh, with Scott and Larry Sanderson. There's a lot of great players that came through that program over the years. They were running the 18 team. I had the 16 team. And um, I realized at that point that I just, I, I really enjoyed going to the rink more than I liked going to my office where I was actually working and uh, was able to kind of jump away uh, halfway through the year and join the Pittsburgh Forge midway through the year that year in the North American Hockey League in, uh, I don't know, 01, 02, I think it was. And, and the journey began of being a full-time coach. So it, with Pittsburgh, um, from, from Pittsburgh, you went to Everett. With, you know, I, I think you crossed paths with Coach Kevin Constantine. And can you talk about kind of your time with Coach Constantine? And if, if for the viewers who don't know Coach Constantine, he was an NHL coach for the Pittsburgh Penguins. And um, I know he has a lot of influence, a lot of different guys. Yeah, my time with Kevin was pretty interesting because we were, um, we were running the junior team in Pittsburgh, the Pittsburgh Forge. Uh, and we were running hockey schools, uh, private lessons. We were doing kind of everything in hockey um, that you could think of out of the Island Sports Center before Robert Morris came along. And, um, you know, my move to the Western Hockey League was with Kevin. He got the job out here and he, he brought me with him. And uh, we spent some, some time out here uh, in the Western Hockey League after that. Uh, Kevin was, a, was an unbelievable teacher. Like he, he was able to really – break down the habits and details of the game that were so important and in all aspects uh, on the offensive side of the puck, uh, as well as the defensive side. And, and then, so you, you were there from 03 to 2011, and then you went to probably not a typical hockey spot, France. How was that out there in France? Yeah, my move to France was, was unique. I was able to work um, here in Everett, uh, you know, for some great coaches, over the time, but I couldn't ever get a head coaching job. Uh, I was a longtime assistant associate coach here. 
Uh, Craig Hartsburg was a coach for a while and he had uh, open heart surgery during the season. So I got to run the team for a while. And uh, during that period of time, um, you know, I, I realized, hey, I think I'm ready to go be a head coach. I had been an assistant coach for almost assistant coach, associate coach for almost 10 years, I think, at that point. And I thought, hey, I, I need I, I'm ready to go do this. And I kind of found myself in a lot of different interviews. And I, the question I kept running into is you don't have any head coaching experience. I don't know if you're you're really ready for this. And I was like, I, I have to go find a place where I can be a head coach. And it just happened to be Angers, France and the league Magnus. And uh, I had some people that I knew who played in the league at the time and uh, had a conversation and it was time. So I, I kind of jumped off and went after it. And uh, it was a really good league. It, it, I learned a lot over there. Uh, it's, it's really interesting. The thing I'd say most about the French league is the game was never the same any night because we had some Olympic sheet, some NHL size sheets, we had three Amer uh, three Canadian coaches, one American coach, two Finnish coaches, and, and like some Swedes coaching in the league along with some French guys. Um, so everybody had a really different style in their game uh, as opposed to maybe in North America here where it's, it's, it's more the same night in, night out. It's everybody's doing pretty much the same stuff. How many players did you have that spoke different languages? How was that language barrier and trying to build those relationships? Yeah, the language thing was pretty interesting because the savior was there was English in the locker room. But we had uh, a Swede, a Finnish player, an Estonian player. Uh, we had some some players from Quebec. And, and uh, I think at the time you had to have um, 12 natural born French players on your roster every night out of 20. OK, cool. And then from there, you got an opportunity with Sioux City out in the USHL. Uh, how was that time there? Um... Yeah, Sioux City was pretty special for me. I played in, in Dubuque in the USHL before going to Union. Um, so it was kind of my second time on the circuit and this time being a coach. And uh, the time in Sioux City was really special, mostly because of the, the ownership group we were working for. Um, was a, was a St. Louis base group. And uh, they were pretty special. I thought we had uh, our, our goals were really aligned in terms of providing an environment for guys to make that next step to college hockey. There's that in-between period. And, and uh, we had a lot of good players who came through Sioux City and, and we were able to work with and, and kind of help reach their, their next goal, which was college hockey and hopefully beyond for, for some of them still. When you uh, say providing that environment, what kind of stuff would you do? Just maybe a short you know, how do you provide it for those players who are, quote unquote, some of the best players in the country? Um, what would you do different than a, in France or um, maybe your other stops in the OHL? Yeah, I don't know if it's different. I think it's the same. I think when you talk environment, you want to create a place where players want to come play. Uh, you want to create a locker room that um, guys are excited to get there in the day. They're excited to get to work. You want to create um, that practice environment where they're, they're really enjoy the hard work and the challenge of it. Um, but it's rewarding. So they, you, you can't let down expectations, but you got to create that space that they want to come. Okay. And then you, you headed over to Kingston back in the OHL for a year, um, before joining the, the, the uh, Coyotes organization and, you know, some really good things from Steve Sullivan, who's the Roadrunners general manager said in a quote about, about you getting the players to buy in takes great communication and the right person um, for you as a head coach to respect, to have the respect of the players, you have to have a relationship with them. It's not just small talk either. It's the conversations that are going to help them get better. Can you kind of talk a, a, about that and how you build those relationships with your players? Yeah, it, for me, it's just getting to know people. Um, I, I don't think it really matters what league you're in or what level you're in. Uh, you got to take time to get to know uh, the people on your staff and the people on your team, your players, um, with things outside the game. And I think a lot of that's just conversation. Uh, as you're building the team, as you're spending time in, in preseason, in, in training camp, those type of situations, uh, some calls over the summer, where you start to, to develop 
that that dialogue between them. Uh, and at, at the end of the day, the first thing is, is the group has to trust you. So through those conversations, that communication, hopefully you're able to to develop some trust. And with that, um, respect comes after. So I want to touch on your USA hockey experience. I know you, you know, you got a lot of gold medals, uh, for, for USA hockey in, in a number of different ways or different spots. One as a world junior, uh, coach in 2010 is a gold medal. And then two world junior A challenges as gold medals. Can you talk about your experiences with, you know, those teams and the international experience, um, yeah, um, you know, there was there were some situations, I think, anytime you get an opportunity to represent USA Hockey, it's it's an amazing opportunity as a player, as a coach, staff, <clears throat> whatever it may be. Um, the 2010 um, situation, I was the video coach, so I wasn't really on the bench. Um, but at the time, I was working in the Western Hockey League, and there were some Western Hockey League players uh, on the team, so... I was added to the staff and um, in a lot of ways, Dean blaze in a, in a short term event kind of changed my whole outlook on coaching, just in terms of how he was able to provide a message to a team to get him to compete so hard. I think that was uh, Dean's specialty in the game. If you ever talk to anybody who played for Dean or around Dean, uh, he had a really, uh, interesting way of, of motivating his teams and getting them to play hard. And, um, you know, I, I really respected that. And I thought it, it, it really helped me as a coach, those opportunities. Uh, you can say in one way they're life-changing because you have a, an idea of how you should coach as a younger coach, or I don't know, I guess I was a younger coach at the time still, maybe I'm still a younger coach. I, I don't really know, but I was, um, you know, open-minded and learning and, and you try and learn from everybody you're with. And, and those tournaments, those short-term tournaments uh, create a great environment for that because you're not with your normal staff and you see things a little different. And, and a lot of times you can implement that in your own coaching repertoire as you, as you go along. And, and I know we we're going to talk about our, the team identity. And I'm going to pull it up now. I think it's perfect segue for you and your opportunity when you coach the 2016 World Junior A Chambers, do you want to kind of set the stage as I'm pulling up the, the document? Yeah, the, the World Junior A Challenge for, for everybody out there is uh, it's really a, a USHL all-star team. Uh, Mark Boxer has been the GM for a long time. And him, along with the, the staff he chooses for the year, uh, will go out and watch games and find players to, to represent USA Hockey at a tournament. Uh, sometime in December, I know the, the months have changed a little year to year um, to represent the country against uh, other teams, two teams from Canada, usually Russia, Finland, Sweden's got a team, the, the Czechs have a team sometimes, Denmark has a team sometimes. So it's a little bit of a rotating schedule in terms of that, but a, a really high level competition. And um, I think this time of year, uh, we're all studying the game. We're all trying to learn. And from our standpoint, I know as coaches, myself included, I'm watching webinars every other day. I'm taking notes. I'm about 17 page deep on notes uh, right now, just things that other coaches are saying. And really, it's a huge collection of data. And I find myself uh, when I'm in these information collecting phases, uh, trying to have to boil it down to, to put it to use. And I thought today we could really talk about a team identity. And team identity to me is what someone says about your team after they watch you play. So whoever it is, scout, fan, another coach, players watching, when they walk out of the rink, they, they, they say this about your team. And uh, team identity to me is an exercise uh, that you can do that kind of combines a lot of these words you hear about in management, words like, a vision, which maybe is not an attainable thing, but something that you want, or a mission statement, which is kind of who we want to be, and or, or goals, just team goals that are measurable and attainable. And I think team identity is maybe all of those things in my world morphed together uh, that we can use as a daily roadmap uh, as we're working with our team um, or a short-term event like we're talking about here. So this is a little bit of a case study um 
And like you said, we were able to win the tournament. So uh, we can use it as a case study and say it was successful. But at, at the end of the day, we had a lot of really good players um, who bought into this concept that we just kind of presented. So can you see that, Coach? Yeah, it looks great. Okay. Um, so what we'll do here is I think I'm just going to rip through this uh, for a period of time and try not to be too long with it. Uh, and then maybe we get some questions going or uh, we got some other things. Maybe we get into some personal identity of coaches and, and, and defining yourself a little bit on top of this. But if we look at this sheet here, uh, the exercise and how we got to this sheet was uh, I came up with compete, discipline, structure, and our way, along with a group of other words underneath. Um, but I, I, I had kind of set it up a little bit. And then we had a meeting with our, our coaching staff for the 2006 team, which was J.B. Bittner and Chris Hartsburg. And we would, we would hash through all these things. And um, the one thing for me is I just think words get lost in hockey a lot. Um, you know, you hear coaches in interviews, myself included, oh, we, we played to our identity tonight. Well, what does that mean? Uh, well, it has meaning to us. And we know what we're talking about, or that guy really competes. Uh, okay, yeah, what, well, what does that mean to you? And I think um, words in hockey, you can define them however you want for your own group. Um, so I'm going to start with our compete here. And winning battles to us was we wanted to be a team in the tournament that got to 50-50 pucks. We wanted to come out of those all day long. We wanted to be good in our battles. Uh, and, and coming up with pucks, not just running around and hitting guys. And we could come into the game and said after the game, oh, we had 37 hits tonight. We were great. Uh, we wanted to be a team that, that won our battles uh, all over the ice. We wanted to do that forecheck and we wanted to do that in defensive zone coverage. Uh, so this exercise right now is really what we got to with the team when we sat down to the first, first meeting. Uh, own the blue. So defensively, we wanted our, our defensemen to be really good around the blue paint and minimize second chance opportunities. We wanted to be good boxing out. And on the flip side, we wanted our forwards to just be hungry. We wanted to be a pack at the net all the time, whether it was screens, rebounds, goalies made saves, and the whistle blew. We always wanted to be there. And first to the puck is we wanted to, we wanted to be all over the puck all the time. If it was a rebound that came off our goalie we wanted to be the first person on it no matter what uh getting to that thing ready to make breakout plays if we were four checking and we had a support situation on a rush and we had to chip a puck we wanted to get first touch on that puck uh so it was a lot about this 50 50 mindset uh of hunting the puck checking this is one of the words like i, I love and i in interviews i'm probably guilty of it more than anybody's i i just thought we checked well tonight uh, so, what, you know, what is checking? What does that mean? Uh, checking to me is stopping the puck. So uh, we wanted to be a team that was good when the other team had it, that we took away time and space, stick on puck, and we were able to, to kill those pucks and, and start the rest of our game, not uh, maybe going to hit guys with their stick in the air. We wanted to be good at checking throughout the course of the tournament. and Then blocking shots like it's cliche, but it was something that we wanted to talk about as a group and uh, encourage. We built a lot of energy on our bench through block shots uh, as we were going through that. So these first set of words in terms of compete really gives you a roadmap to a lot of discussions. And I'm just going to rip. I wrote a few down here. Just your meetings. You could use these words in your meeting. Hey, boys, we got to win battles tonight. That's what we got to do. And everybody knew what that meant because we had defined it. It could be a situation where after practice, you got a little message to the team and it was like, hey, last night I thought we did a really good job owning the blue paint, make sure we're there again tonight. Um, at timeouts, maybe it's that language that you created with this identity that um, when you got five minutes, you know, 30 seconds there and you're, you're sitting on the bench uh, with five minutes left in the period. And you just said, hey, we got to check these last five minutes, make sure we're checking. Um, so it creates those language uh, as you're going through this and short term events or the full full year. I think these are, are really powerful. And uh, again, between periods, it might be 
something that you just run into the guy in the hallway and just said, you know, good job being first to the puck. Let's stay on that tonight. Um, so I think these are all, uh, this identity thing is also building a language for your team to understand your point in, in quick bullet point situations. So um, move on to discipline here. And discipline, you know, the first thing discipline to me when it came to mind was not taking penalties. And you want to be a disciplined team. You want to make sure that uh, you're heading on the power play more than you're on the penalty kill, those type of situations. Uh, but as we got into our discussion with this thing, we wanted to be really disciplined in our practice, meaning we wanted to use every second of our practice to build habits. Uh, because this USHA, this short-term event thing, uh, every player is coming from a different team. Maybe you got two or three guys from one team, uh, but everybody's coming from a different environment and you got to in a quick amount of time develop some real continuity and we thought our practices could do that if, if we we're disciplined in our habits and then meetings um you know meetings get boring to players and in this event we actually had an entire day of meetings because we didn't have ice everybody was flying in it was before we really started practicing i think we had three days of practice before we played our first game so you had to meet and they had to be meaningful and we had to be dialed in. So we talked about it. We addressed it in this first meeting of, if we have a meeting, it's gonna be meaningful and we're gonna, we're gonna work at, at trying to put something in or uh, refine something. Uh, so our meetings, you gotta be disciplined. Our preparation just, we're on the road for a long period of time, 10 days or whatever in this tournament. So preparation was key, making sure we are eating right, we were sleeping right. If we didn't have the food or, whatever wasn't provided, let's make sure, let's have the conversation, let's get it, let's, let's be prepared in everything we're doing. And the next two are really interesting, um, emotion, discipline and emotion. Um, Short-term events, uh, first time you put on the USA hockey jersey, uh, you get pretty emotional, it's, it's exciting. And it was exciting for a lot of these players to represent their country but it also gets emotional during the games and, and we had to be disciplined in how we manage that emotion and not getting too high and not, not getting too low, but still being locked in at the same time. So we would have conversations about that. We would, we would talk about that. We would talk about the emotion that we were gonna feel on the night. So when, when we, we hit those moments, we were ready for them. Uh, and we had to be disciplined in it because yeah, it's an emotional game and that, that's why it's so great. And then last is just anybody who's ever been to an IHF event is you really never know what's going to happen in the refing. Uh, the refing at the IHF level is slightly different than many of the leagues we all play in. So maybe a hit in one league is a penalty in, a, in an international event. Maybe a slash in one league isn't a penalty and is. So you just never really know what's going to happen there. And there might be a, a bad call for the other team, for your team. Whatever it is, uh, I think you have to be disciplined and, and ready for that. So uh, we talked about that as well. Um, should I just keep rolling here? Yeah, I got, a, I got a question. So when you started to build this out, when did you start doing this, you know, this type of worksheet? Yeah, well, it started when we were like just selecting the team. So it, the I don't know the exact timing of the whole process, but um you know, USA Hockey and Mark Boxer selects the coaching staff. And as you select the coaching staff, you start working on, on seeing the players and you start having a couple meetings. And we started really early in the process on that. And I think as we were, were talking about a lot of these things, it also created some language for our staff as we were evaluating the players. And uh, did uh, Coach Blaze do something like this back in 2010? Or is this... How did this come about where you started doing this kind of team identity type thing? I have no idea really where it came from. It's just kind of, <laughs> it's a great question. And I thought that's why the seminar, um, I thought that's why this would be a great just topic and, to, to discuss. Yeah. Cause I don't really know where I got it from. And I, you know, I feel a lot of Dean Blaze coming out when I'm talking about this, but there was never really a document like this. And, um, you know, I think this tournament allowed us to, to kind of put this together as a staff and it was unique. I thought like, I see the word endurance up top. Is that a theme or can you talk about that? 
Yeah. So um, we were going to um, Bonneville, Alberta, and I think it was minus 30 or something crazy. Like it was, it was cold. So, um, you know, as we were kind of heading into the tournament, um, we just used endurance from Shackleton, the book, as a theme. And we kind of told the players, hey, here's a link. You can go watch a YouTube on it. Here's the book. Maybe read the book because we're going to be talking about that. So we kind of like bounced back and forth from a, a theme, which was endurance and and uh, how Shackleton kind of made it through that situation on, on the boat, the endurance, or he wasn't on the boat that long. Um, as, as well as kind of our identity that we were talking about here. So uh, we had used some video clips in our meetings uh, with the players and it kind of became together a, um, what we were about on the, on the trip. Cool. Cool. Uh, you want to keep, let's keep going. Let's do the structure. Sure. Whatever you structure. Yep. So, you know, like when you do something like this, there's always that tactical book or plan or manual or whatever it is and uh, a lot of times it's it's just to keep everything organized and have that plan to go back to um, but we wanted to boil it down into some real habits that we thought we needed to have within that structure and staying on the d side of everything for us we just thought was important like it whatever our coverage that we were doing in that tournament it was hey uh, you know make sure we're on the d side when you find yourself there and over the top was just language for us. We, we didn't want to give up odd man attacks. We wanted to make teams earn their ice uh, through the tournament. Uh, but that didn't mean that we weren't going to go after it. We weren't just hanging high guys. We wanted to make sure we were strides and we were over the top. And then, um, you know, our overall mindset was if we didn't have the puck, we wanted to pressure. We wanted to be moving. We wanted to be closing. We wanted to, to be aggressive. We wanted to play on our toes. And as we got that puck, we wanted to transition as quick as we possibly could and, and get heading get heading north. We wanted to, to be an attacking group. And then lastly is we wanted to drive everything to the net. We wanted to shoot. We wanted to take pucks to the net. We wanted to get second chances. So we wanted to have that attack the net mindset. Um, and we thought if we could have those habits with the structure that we were setting up for the tournament, as we were teaching, um, that was going to be kind of our our language that we could use again in those situations we talked about uh, and defining our words. So like, hey, let's get our structure right today, guys. It's starting to slip a little bit. Make sure we're over the top. So um, those are things that we were able to grab onto. And we'll just finish up with, with our way is when you're going to a short-term event uh, and you're picking this team, you know, these guys on their own team play in every situation. They play in the last minute uh, when they're five on six. They play in the last minute when they're six on five. They play on the power play. They, they play on the penalty kill. And when you go to a short-term event, everybody's going to have roles, and we see it a little further down there. But we wanted to be the best version of ourselves in that role. So maybe a guy was a penalty killer on the trip and, like, be the best version of that penalty killer and don't be frustrated about the other things. Um, being professional, we just wanted to, to represent ourselves and USA Hockey the right way. And that wasn't just on the ice. That was everywhere we went, uh, whether it be in the lobby, whether it be at the lunch line. And, and you know, treat people with respect, uh, whether they're the servers at the team meal. And a lot of times in those events, it, it happens to be the same people in those rooms. So you start to build a relationship with those guys, your bus driver. Whoever it is, we just wanted to be um, professional in what we were doing there. And best version and embrace roles is, is pretty much the same. But as we progressed to the tournament, everybody kind of developed a role uh, in terms of what we were asking them to do and, and the ability to accept that role and encourage others that, you know, were in a role maybe they wanted to be in was, was, was important. Uh, threshold was was really important and threshold for me is we wanted to be able to have a high threshold of handling situations. So if we go down by two goals and, and all of a sudden we're three on five killing uh, instead of being upset by the moment, it was just embrace the moment and have a high threshold and be ready to execute in the moment uh, because we had to make it through that. 
And if it didn't, we were going to go down three. And if we went down three, who cares? Like, we got to find a way to get back and get the first goal as we head back. So we wanted to to reduce our panic level and make sure we had a, a high threshold emotionally to, as a team to handle those situations. And then all in, just the idea that we were all in this trip together uh, and it relates right back to our endurance where they were stuck on the ice float and they were all in that situation together for a long period of time. And um, it was about solutions and finding a way to be successful. What, what was um, any type of challenge or thing that the team had to overcome and how did you kind of overcome that challenge with the team, whether it was on the ice or off the ice? Yeah. Um, I don't remember the, the two. So I did the 2014 and the 2016 and they, they run together, but I think we lost the game early in the tournament, um, which meant we might have to play an extra day. So everybody was kind of panicked early in the tournament that we were going to have to maybe play an extra game or a quarterfinal game to get into the semifinal game. And, um, you know, I think with that situation, it was, let's just worry about the, what we can control. And that's the next game. So let's not get worked up. Let's not worry about that situation. That situation's gone. Let's, let's move forward and, and start thinking about our next situation. And how about with the team, identity? which one was probably the biggest challenge for your junior hockey players to, to overcome, you know, I know varied backgrounds. Um, you know, a lot of this is, is really basic uh, words and hockey to get thrown around a lot, but I thought the clear definition of it gave us always something to talk about and, and to grab onto. So I thought when we were all coming from different teams and different ways of playing, uh, we were able to unite around this, this kind of uh, common words. And, and one thing that was great is you're in these tournaments and you're kind of moving in and out of locker rooms and stuff. And your training camps in a different rink. We were somewhere, I think, in Edmonton uh, where we had training camp and, and really just a youth rink. Uh, but we were able to make banners and magnets and have this stuff around our room where everybody was able to see it every day. Um, and, you know, in youth hockey, the first thing that comes to mind, if you just had like a magnet like this that went on your board, it's just kind of constantly there. And, you know, sometimes people write words on locker room walls and doors and everything and I think those words get talked about in the beginning and sometimes they get lost but when they are on your walls and they are there you can start to live those words and when you start to live those words there, there starts to be action to them so uh, they're definable and, and you're able to to get after those situations uh, that you're talking about that you're looking at looking at and you start evaluating yourself like hey did I win those battles today Okay, that's that's what I got to fix tomorrow. And then, if you were not doing just a small tournament like this for your season team with the Tucson, what type of differences are there? Any differences in how you produce this kind of team identity, or you're involved in players, or how does that all work um, with more of a season-long yeah. team? Yeah, with different staff. I think that's where it started. You know, like it would start with a. We don't actually have one of these in Tucson. Maybe we should. I'm talking about it right now. So maybe I should be getting one together. Uh, but I think it's um, it's really about your staff and what you're trying to get accomplished in that season or that short tournament or whatever it is. And I think it probably varies uh, on age group uh, of what you're trying to get accomplished. So I think this is really just a, for me, it was it was a format to filter information. Like I talked about earlier is we're going out and everybody's right now doing all this information, collecting this data and uh, being able to, to put it down in a translatable form to a player. Players, players want to play. The game of hockey is fast. Things happen in a hurry. Um, you know, and you, we have to train that IQ, but we have to have a, a path for them to, to also communicate that as we're helping them or coaching them or are working with them in situations to, to understand what we're talking about. Uh, so we have a question uh, about a uh, coach blaze question. Uh, sure. Coach Mike wants to know, uh, given examples uh, how coach blaze motivated before a game 
or just expand on your comments about Coach Blaze. And uh, maybe just give a little background about Coach Blaze for some of the uh, people watching that maybe have never heard of him. Um, yeah, well, Dean Blaze had an amazing run in North Dakota, coached at UNO for a period of time. Um, I think he did the World Juniors uh, a couple times, you know, um, and, and some other situations. I don't know his whole background there. Um, but, um, you know, I would say Dean Blaze let his staff work. He didn't get caught up in the in the details of the game. I thought he was amazing at boiling down uh, things that were really important for hockey teams to win. And the number one part of that was compete. And his teams would compete. They would skate. Uh, they were hard to play against. And uh, I just thought he had a really unique way uh, of getting that message across uh, with all his groups where, wherever he went. Was there anything in particular in practice that, you know, that you took from Dean, you know, incorporating this discipline and, you know, within the practice structure? Because a lot of the times, right, you, you guys play 76 games in Tucson or 74. Um, but, you know, sometimes you got a lot of practices where the learning happens. How do you instill it within practices for your athletes? Yeah, um, I would say that, you know, the one thing that I learned is just the simplicity of the game. Uh, uh, again, the, there's a lot of things in the game of hockey. We, like I said, a lot of these coaches, myself included, have these tech packs that are 25 pages of, of tactics and, and things like that, which all that's important. You have to have that. But at the end of the day, we got to boil that down to the skills the players need to be successful in doing that. Um, because if they can't pass, if they can't skate, uh, if they're not able to, to play a two-on-one game, then it's hard to implement any of these other things. So I think being able to boil the, the game down to teachable packets of work and, you know, like the ADM stuff where there's small units working together and stations is a, is a great way to do that. I, I love that concept of teaching skill. Uh, but as you're teaching that skill, I think it's important to execute that skill at a really high rate. So if you're you're working on shooting where you're catching it on the forehand and moving it to the backhand, uh, you gotta you gotta do it the right way. You gotta make sure you got your weight transfer and, and all the things that go with it to to execute it. Um, talk about the two on one game. I, I know you just said it, but uh, having the two on one game is that something that you're you're focused on with your players even at the pro level? Yeah, I think, you know, the game of hockey is, is about support. Um, and it doesn't matter what level you're at. And the ability to support and make plays and outnumber uh, is massive. And, and the ability to, to get there, communicate, execute the play uh, at high speeds is, is important to be successful. Uh, and I kind of want to shift gears about just kind of relationships with, with your players and, um, and working towards – getting the, the most out of them and the best version of themselves. You know, you have goalies on here and, you know, sometimes that's, th that's tough to, to work with goalies as a head coach. How do you work with, with the goalies and what do you do to kind of include them within, um, you know, the head coach? And it's true. It's, I mean, I, I was a goalie, but also a head coach and it's hard to, to, to manage that. And what, what do you do with, with your goalies to build that relationship? Watch the goalie coach. <laughs> No, yeah, um, um, the situation with goalies, uh, I think it's important that, that head coaches um, learn to, to build that relationship and not be scared of, of the world of goaltending. I think goaltending is a little different. They, they usually have their own coach. They got their own coach back home. The, a lot of times at any level I've been at, you know, the goalies have that relationship by that time. Uh, and then there's probably like a part-time goalie coach in, in junior hockey. A lot of times it'll come in and come out. So um, one thing that, that just comes to mind right away is make sure you take care of them and don't forget about them. And I think a warm up before the, the practice starts, I know there's ice time situations in youth hockey a little bit, but if you can sneak out and you can give those guys uh, maybe with your assistant coach three or four minutes while you're maybe doing another drill uh, with the players to warm up the goalies. So you let the, 
the assistant coach uh, go down with the goalies and you do like maybe a little passing drill in the circles or a small area game to start practice without a goalie. Um, I think those situations are really important for those guys. So they get in a routine and, and they're ready and prepared for practice. And, and then the ability to just give those guys some shots to start practice a little bit before you go uh, three on O on them or something crazy and, and they don't really have a chance. So the, the ability for them to see pucks and field pucks uh, before you get into maybe a two on one or three on two situation in practice and, and uh, they're getting drilled right away. So um, building that kind of part of practice out and, and having that conversation with those guys has been something that I've always enjoyed doing uh, even before practice. Uh, being able to to go out with those guys and and maybe uh, they're doing their skating drills and I'm just kind of watching and talking to the to the backup or the other goalie whoever's not in the drill uh, just standing over and talking about whatever it is um, I think it's a great time to to have that communication. Uh, another uh, question coming from compare today's player versus a player when you first started coaching. Yeah, I think today's player is just way more, uh, maybe way more, they have more information. I think today's players got, uh, you know, four different kinds of coaches. When they go home, they got a nutritionist, they got a strength coach, they got a mental coach, they got a skills coach, they got a skating coach. Um, you know, I think when we started, um, there were there were skating coaches and skills coaches, but I don't think they were as prevalent as they are now. And I think all those guys are, are really good at what they do and helping those players. And I think it's, it's pretty interesting that they have all that to, to go home to and get that kind of teaching. I, I think that's amazing. Um, but then now when they get in the team environment, you used to, you used to touch all those things. Like as a head coach, I would be out working on skating and sometimes I still do. I like, um, you know, whatever skating things that I've learned along the way, it, it's maybe, um, you know, working with some guys on that situation. And when you do that, I think the guys really care. Um, you know, the guys begin to develop that, that communication with you because uh, when you're really digging into those things, you're actually helping the individual player grow and they know it. They know that you're working with them. You, they know you, you know, you care about them and you're working on their game. Uh, and I think as you d develop and build those individual players, and help them grow, your team's gonna grow. Uh, so I was watching something on Twitter about uh, pregame speeches and speeches w uh, for coaches. How do you come up with your, you know, you got three, two intermissions, one pregame speech, you got 200 speeches before games or in between games and all of that. Like what's, what's your way of, of, of getting to the point and what's your kind of philosophy of trying to get what you want being said? Yeah, well, I think it's a, it's a little different everywhere you go. Like there was a period of time where I never talked to the team before the game. I would talk to the team at five o'clock. Um, but then I wouldn't talk to the team again until in between periods. And uh, a lot of times the assistant coaches would go in right before the game started with whatever technique they wanted to use to maybe get a little juice going. And, and sometimes as a head coach, uh, you want to, maybe be a little more on the serious side in terms of your approach to things. And uh, some of the assistant coaches that I've had in the past had a little different relationship with the guys in terms of being able and to, to maybe get a laugh out of them, to cut the tension a little bit or whatever it may be. So, uh, you know, we kind of, we would rotate like with the assistant coaches sometimes going in and talking right before the game. But I think it's, it's whatever the relationship is with the, the staff and the team and, and uh, doing what's comfortable. Um, do you, what kind of level of video do you guys use at the American Hockey League level? Like what? We don't do we don't do video. You don't? No, none no. zero. <laughs> uh, yeah, there's uh, it's pretty extensive. I think um, anybody in in coaching today, uh, you you almost feel like you're attached to the computer. Um, the one thing I can tell you that somebody asked the question of what's different between coaching the players of today as opposed to the players when we started. Um, I actually, when I started coaching, 
used a double deck VHS to break a game down. So it's go video. Like you can go look them up on uh, the go video. When I first started coaching, I would have like, I don't know, eight system tapes and then individual player tapes. And when you watch the game, you'd have to like throw the four check tape in, take the four check clip, take the four check tape out, take the four check neutral zone tape in. So, um, yeah, it was pretty labor intensive. It was, it was a battle and the, the technology that's developed in the game has, has been amazing just in terms of the software that, that you can use in terms of breaking games down. And I think, you know, it, it's becoming more affordable in situations like uh, Steva and Huddle and those situations where, um, you know, you can get game tape easier now. Like um, you used to have to have a parent with the VHS up in the stands recording. Now there's a stand with an iPad and there's all these rinks with the cameras tracking things that uh, you can get game footage uh, way easier. And then, Obviously, in, in our world, it's kind of our lifeline, and, and we lean on it quite a bit. How long do you usually have a video session with the players? So you have professional players going right now. So it's their job, but a lot of them are a lot younger. How much time are you having that meeting? I know, you know, I've talked to coaches where they say, hey, seven minutes is my max. That's as long as – because you're probably doing video a lot more often than, you know, a typical youth coach or somebody else. But what's your kind of guidelines? Yeah, I like to be seven to 10 minutes, really. Um, and I don't think the 10 minutes is, is full video. Um, you know, there might be a, a little conversation with the whiteboard to explain the topic that we're getting into at that period. And then we get to the video clips that are included in that. So maybe the talk's 10, 12 minutes, but the video might be six or seven minutes in that talk, or there's a topic you got to clean up for the day, um, whatever it is. So I try to have a meeting time and never more than, than 12 minutes in terms of my meetings. Um, and if there is going to be something longer, uh, a lot of times I'll address the team and just say, hey, we got a situation here. We got to fix. This is going to take more than our normal stuff. So so dig in. Like, let's get ready. Like, let's, let's get after this thing. So uh, that's in the team environment. But... Um, you know, I think there's a lot of, of good things that happen in individual meetings uh, with video and small group meetings. And a lot of times those might just be a clip or two that you're able to kind of grab a guy walking around the locker room and say, hey, this happened last game. Come take a look at this here. And, uh, you know, then that gets into a conversation where you're discussing something. And, you know, I think that's where real growth comes, um, especially with coaches that sometimes we forget about is, um, we have a lot of really good players who play for us at all levels that see the game through their eyes and what's happening with them on the ice. And a lot of times they have a, a vision or an idea of what's happening. And then when you get in that conversation, like maybe, maybe they have something, maybe there's something for, to discuss a little further or dig into. And uh, I have a lot of time. I have a lot of fun with players in situations like that. Just, just talking about uh, how they saw the game, what, what was happening at that time. And, and then, uh, then comes the discussion. And then kind of going back to your team identity, is there any a time when you're putting the players in charge of kind of defining those um, ideas? Um, I know in the smaller envi environment it might be harder, but how, how are you including those players maybe with coming up with those? Yeah, I don't think um, we include the players in coming up with those a lot, but I think we include the players in evaluating them a lot. Uh, you know, so for example, I might just get to a player and be like, Hey, how were you at being first to the puck last night? So then they look at you and they're like, some guys, uh, some players see every game and they can replay the whole game in their head. There, there's that guy in your locker room. And then there's some guys who have no idea what happened in last night's game. And then sometimes you'll be like, okay, well, take a look at these seven clips and then tell me what you think. And was your evaluation before the 10 clips the same as your evaluation after the 10 clips? Um, so I think that's where your identity and your relationship with the players uh, will come into play. So we, we talked with Coach Hines last week, and he was discussing the kind of the difference between practices for development compared to practices for maintenance. And with them, with the 82 game schedule, they're playing essentially every other day. Your schedule is very similar in a different way you know, with the travel, with the air travel and all that. 
how do, what do you focus on in practice and how do you break down your weeks um, for the development? Because essentially the American Hockey League is a development league with pressure to win, you know, in some respects, but uh, how do you break that down? Yeah, I would say we, you know, like development practices are most of our practices in the American Hockey League. Uh, our job is to try and help players develop and, and um, help them grow their game so that they can become NHL players. So um, we have to have those development situations constantly to, to help them grow and be better. And I think uh, for us, that's where our focus is. And the maintenance practice, um, you know, those are situations that may be a little more NHL type deal um where they're there if you look at their schedule they're every other day play day off play day off two days off play um in the american hockey league we're uh, a little more uh friday saturday uh but we have a lot of like weekday games and, and saturday games but uh for the most part the american hockey league doesn't have as many three and threes as they used to way back when uh so there's a lot of really good practice time for us uh, to dig in and and I would say the American Hockey League schedule is a lot closer to like uh, maybe a major junior schedule or a USHL schedule. How about uh, with so many different players coming in, in in and out of the American Hockey League? Sometimes you could have crazy amount. They're either getting pulled up or whatnot. How do you work that team identity and environment um, with those new players that you know maybe just joined or coming down even from the NHL? you know, not really loving being there. Yeah, well, I think the identity thing is pretty simple because all the players that are kind of moving through an American Hockey League season are all in the organization. So, um, you know, like the team identities tied to an organization identity. So you're, you're trying to just build that identity with those players uh, to make it as seamless as possible. So if they are called up or if, you know, Rapid City is our East Coast League team, if a player comes up from Rapid City, uh, there's not a whole lot of time to, to figure that out. They've heard it. They've been through training camp. And then, uh, you know, they're, they're right into it and they're playing and just kind of next man up mentality. Cool. Um, so uh, what's the plan for the next few weeks? What else are you doing? How I know you're talking about webinars, but, you know, what what do you, what else are you doing to to learn and get better? Yeah, I've taken a, a little different approach. I try to watch uh, maybe a, a game a day, uh, just any level of hockey. Like sometimes we get caught up. I talked a little bit about it when we coached in France. There's there's some variety in, in that league in terms of the coaches, and I think uh, we get caught up in the season watching so much video of us and the teams we're playing and and NHL games that. Um, we lose track of some other levels and now I think is a, is a good time to just go watch games from other leagues, just have a look at a college hockey game and, and see um, a little different style of maybe what's happening or watch a USHL game and, and see what's happening there. So, um, you know, European games are, are fun to watch for me as well. Like the, the ice is a little different, um, but to just, I try to watch a game a day and, and uh, keep my brain uh, moving that way a little bit. Another thing that I've been doing a little bit is I've been trying to talk to coaches outside of hockey because I think what's happening is, you know, you guys do such a great job with the coaching seminar and, the, you know, another change I think that's been huge since I started coaching is the amount of information a coach can get today. I think, uh, you know, 2000, you, there's about three coaching clinics in the world that you could go to to hear people speak and there were really nothing you could go grab online and now it's there's so much information out there that we, we just have at our fingertips so we're all kind of getting that same information and talk as we're going through it um, but the ability to maybe go look at some other sports right now some other coaches uh, some high school coaches in your area that are doing different things and um, I've been able to just, just talk to some people like that, um, which allows you to, um, I think expand to, to take a little different approach to something we've been doing uh, for a long time. And, and maybe it's something you can add in. 
And if you had to give, uh, so I got a two part question. One, if you, um, word of advice for a young coach, Jay Verity coming from Union College, what would you give him or her, um, whoever at the age? And then from the player side of it, what would you give a, a young youth hockey player, you know, maybe 11 or 12? Yeah, um, I have no idea what I would tell a young Jay Verity except uh, good luck, son. Like, get to work. Um, no, I think in terms of, of coaching, I think you, you got to work at it every day. Uh, you got to try and continually make yourself better. You got to learn. You got to expand. Um, but uh, work with the players. Every every time you get a chance to to get on the ice with with a player, a group of players, uh, find a way to help them. Find a way to help them be better. Uh, find a way to help them grow. Uh, use some piece of your knowledge uh, and give it back. Uh, so if it's something you learned, a lesson you learned, a technique you've learned, a tactic you've learned, like help those players with that. Don't say, ah, oh, he should know that. Like, no, like let's just, just spend the time. Um, you know, that player's taking the time to put his equipment on and you decided to get on the ice with them, then, then get to work with them and like uh, try to spend the time with that player all the time, uh, making them better. Uh, that's what I, would, that's, I think the advice that I would give a, a young Jay Verde. Um, and then in terms of the player, um, I think anybody, well, I, let me take that back. I think, and you thought you just go to the rink and enjoy the game, fall in love with the game. Um, I think, you know, a youth coach, um, just make it enjoyable, teach the lessons, use the identity, uh, use your passion for the game, but make it enjoyable for the players where they fall in love with the game because the people, as you progress through hockey that really love the game, find a way to be successful at it. And if if the environments in youth hockey for, for our kids to play is enjoyable and fun and, and still challenging and, and still demanding and, and all the things that, that come with our game that, that are so great, but uh, make it fun, make them laugh, make them joke, uh, make them enjoy their teammates, make them enjoy their coaching staff. Um, you know, but I think that's really, really important. Awesome, this, this has been great. Thank you for your time, coach. We really appreciate it. I know we got a lot out of it. And um, do you have anything else you want to just tell the group before you go or before I close nope. off? Okay. Um, no, it was great. Uh, thanks a ton for having me. Uh, I just wanted to say thank you. I don't know who's on the call, but healthcare workers, first responders, all the people working in those um, essential businesses like our grocery stores that are keeping us uh, functioning here on lockdown as we're doing webinars and doing coaching. Um, those guys are, are pretty brave and I, you know, if I defined it. I would say they, they have a pretty high compete level and uh, pretty special what those guys are doing. And uh, hopefully we all get back to, to what we love, which is being on the ice with uh, for our coaches. Very well said. Just want to remind everybody that tomorrow we have ask the ADM managers. We're going to have a handful of our ADM ADM managers on, and we're kind of going to talk, we are going to talk about development myths. So we'll throw out some stuff and, you know, have them talk in a Q&A part there. And then on Thursday, Scott Clemenson, New Jersey Devils, former New Jersey Devil goal, goalie, now goalie coach for them. He'll be on. And then on Friday, we have Coach Jeff Blaschel. So uh, a good week. Coach uh, Verity started, uh, started us off really well. And just want to thank everybody. And we will see you tomorrow at 3.30 is our time. We're back to 3.30. So have a great um, day, and we'll see you tomorrow. Thanks again, Coach Verity. Yep. Thanks for having me.